Hi, Mike Barrett here again from TestingIsEasy.com. I actually just finished making a video about how um, some of the stuff that's in this book, or at least one of the things in this book by the Princeton Review, is actually not indicative of what you'll see on the real test and you know all the things that could potentially be a problem with that. Um, as you know, hopefully, if you've been watching these videos, I strongly advocate that you only use real test questions when you prepare for a test, because otherwise you run a risk of building up bad instincts and or uh, trying to study and master ideas that aren't in the real test or whatever it is. Anyway, so I literally just finished making that video like five minutes ago, and I was slipping through the book, and I noticed <laughs> something else um, in here. So um, again, this is the uh, Princeton Review's Cracking the Pisatinum Squit for uh, 2010. And on page 284 of this uh, fine book, we have um, question number 27, which involves, uh, I'm not going to show you the question because, you know, it's their material, but um, the question involves a function in which a number is raised to a negative fractional exponent. It is raised to the negative two-thirds uh, exponent. So in other words, like x and then to the negative two over three. Now, what is wrong with that, you might ask? Well, I'm happy to tell you. So, on the actual SAT and PSAT, you can't ever be asked to find any root of a number beside the square root. So, that particular question I just mentioned would involve finding the cube root of something which the College Board itself can never ask you to do. And the reason they can never ask you to is they just decided we're not going to ask this. So, um, if you look at, like, real questions in here or real uh, other SAT questions you've been able to get your hands on, um, again, real ones, not ones from some other company, but ones by the actual College Board, you will never see a question that requires you to take a root of some number besides the square root. So it might ask you, you know, to know that the square root of 81 is 9 or negative 9, um, but it would never ask you to know that the cube root of 27 is 3, which it is, right? Yes, okay. Usually I have a hard time doing math on camera. Anyway, so um, they wouldn't ask you to, uh, to uh, do those things. Now, you may be thinking, perhaps, if you're familiar with this book, of a question like the one on page 714. This book, again, is the real College Board actual book book of real questions. On page 714, number 8, there is a question that involves raising something to the power of 6. You know, it's something, uh, in parentheses, raised to the 6th power. And uh, that whole thing is set equal to something else. And a lot of people look at this question and they go, ah, well, here is a situation where I have to find the sixth root of both sides. I've got to take the sixth root of whatever to do this question. So isn't that an example of, uh, you know, what I just said not being true? Isn't it an example of it not being true that you can only take the square root of things? Actually, it's not an example of that, and let me explain why. To solve that particular question, you don't take the sixth root of either side. Instead, you have to do something else with that six. Again, I'm not going to tell you what it is here because I don't want to give away the College Board's uh, question. So, actually, if you're familiar with the real rules and patterns of the actual SAT, then it's even an advantage in situations like this, because where most people are going to look at that and go, oh, I should take the sixth root of both sides, because it kind of seems like the obvious thing. You would know, well, I can't be taking the sixth root of both sides, because that's not a thing the College Board can ask me to do. Therefore, I have to do something else. Let me figure out what that is, right? So it's an advantage for you if you actually know what's going on, <laughs> right? So this is, yet again, one more reason why I strongly encourage you to work only with real College Board questions for the SAT. Or if you're getting ready for the LSAT, only real LSAC questions. Or if it's the GMAT, only real GMAT. Or the GRE, only real ETS. The ACT, only... You get what I'm saying. Like, if you're getting ready for a test, only use actual test questions from that test. Otherwise, you run a very real risk that, like, you might look at that Princeton Review practice question, for instance, that involves taking a number up to the negative two-third exponent, and you might spend some time uh, learning how to do that, you know, which frankly, I mean, it's not a bad thing in itself, but it's not, it has no point for the SAT or PSAT because on the actual test, you can't be asked to do those things. Furthermore, if you were to see a question on the real test, like the College Board question I just described, you might actually think that you should solve that by taking the sixth root of both sides. So you'd be at a disadvantage because a trained test taker who actually understands what can appear on the test is going to know where to look and what to think about, and you are going to be stuck thinking that you should take the sixth root of both sides, or at least you run that risk, if you get ready with stuff like this. So please, when you practice, only practice with real stuff, 
and when you get a piece of advice on how to do something, make sure it works on actual real questions, not on questions made up by the people who gave you the advice. That, again, to me, should be an obvious thing. I just thought I would spell it out, <laughs> right? So uh, this is why, by the way, I only ever show my stuff at work against real questions. When I make up a strategy, not make up, when I find, discover, or find, whatever you want to call it, when I refine a strategy, I refine it by applying myself to real questions, and then I test it afterwards by making sure it works on real questions. And if I should ever see a real question where it doesn't work, I revisit the strategy and make sure I haven't made a mistake somewhere, right? You only, only, only ever want to do that. You don't want to be in the habit of training yourself or testing strategies out against questions that are not real, for reasons that are, I hope, obvious at this point. Anyway, so I'm going to stop repeating that. I just wanted to point it out because I literally just finished making another video about how there's a mistake in here, or at least a thing that's not true about the test. And I was flipping through it randomly, and I found another one, so I thought I would point that out. Uh, okay, that's all. Once again, uh, Mike Barrett here for TestingIsEasy.com, reminding you, please, please, please only use real test questions to get ready for your test. Uh, if you do anything else, you are wasting your time at least, and at worst, uh, at worst, at something. <laughs> What's even possibly worse is you could be uh, developing bad instincts that will cause you to miss questions that everybody else is going to find easy. So thanks very much. Uh, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.